Hey, ladies and gents, welcome to the Controlled Interest Gamecast, where we talk about video games and everything happening in the industry. As always, I'm joined by Jordan. You know, if I were a Dothraki, Jared, <laughs> I would be losing my strength today. Oh, God. Uh, Dominic? What's up, Dom? Shave it all. Oh, God. <laughs> and uh, second, Jordan. Jordan Boyd. How's it going, Jordan? It's going good. I'm excited to be here. Uh, pleasure to have you on the podcast. Um, as our show starts, we always talk about what we've been playing. Uh, for me, uh, I haven't been playing too much. I bought uh, Red Dead Redemption on the backwards compatibility sale for the uh, the big sale that Xbox is doing from the 5th to the 11th. It was $7.50. What I didn't know at the time when I bought it is it actually came with Undead Nightmare as well. So that nice. was awesome. Um, yeah, getting Red Dead for $7, you can't beat it. Uh, it was a sale. I wasn't even planning on playing it or buying it, but I bought it and I'm playing it now. Um, looks a lot. It looks as good as I would. I remembered it looking, um, which is cool. Uh, obviously, it doesn't look crazy good, but uh, usually when you think about how a game looked and you go back and play it, it looks worse, like way worse. And it actually looks pretty good. Um, game's cool. I really hope they announce a follow up. I played Red Dead Revolver, which a lot of people didn't play. Completely different game than Red Dead. But then I played Red Dead Redemption and loved it. So I want to see the third entry in the series. Um, yeah, haven't played much else. Smite, Overwatch, the usuals. But uh, Red Dead was the the anomaly, and I also watched Green Room per Jordan's recommendation. Um, you know, rest in peace, to Anton Yelchin. He's a good yes. actor. Great movie. I don't want to go too long on it. My only problem is some of the parts in that movie are really like cringy. Like when they at the end, Jordan, when they bust in the room and he's like standing there and he has like that one liner and then he jumps down into the basement. Yeah, yeah, kind of cringy. Um, but overall, very intense movie. Didn't know Patrick Stewart was in it. Super surprising, yeah. great actor, um, playing a neo-Nazi. Jared, which is would cool. you say it's almost like, to me, it felt less like a thriller and more like a horror movie in a way? It 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 was very much genre agnostic to me. Like It seemed like it yeah. just like moved all over the place. I couldn't really nail okay. it down. There were parts where it was action, parts where it was horror, parts where it was suspense, parts where it was, parts where it was thriller, parts yeah. where it was comedy. Um, yep. Like when they opened that song, talk uh, the, the cover of the... Uh, Oh, what's the name of that song? I can't remember it. But that co- they're basically bashing Nazis. Um, yeah. yeah. Good movie, though. So what have you guys been playing? Jordan, we'll start with you. The OG Jordan. So, um, unfortunately, I'll just go ahead and get it out of the way. <laughs> I was not able to complete Persona 3, and uh, credits were not rolled. Um, I, I played it a little bit. I played for several hours, and I just couldn't force myself. I was like, you know what? This hair and beard, it's long enough. It's about time to shave anyways. I'll uh, I'll get that done and um, just not worry about it. I'll finish Persona at some point, obviously, before Persona 5 comes out. That's no big deal. So, yeah, there's that. Um, so, yeah, next week uh, we don't have a video podcast, but these guys will be seeing me um, without beard and hair. So, yeah. Oh, rejuvenated. <laughs> so, moving on to what I actually did play. Um, I have, I think last week I had finished the first three episodes of, um, Walking Dead season one, and now I'm at that same spot in Walking Dead season two. So I finished season one. Um, Dom, you talked about the story being a lot better in season two, and I would say that's definitely the case. Way more interesting characters. Um, honestly, like to me, Walking Dead season one didn't even get good until like, very end of episode two, beginning of episode three. So, can we can we spoil it? Can I say something? Yeah, the game's cool. Uh, so if, if people met, care, it's whatever. So the the villain or whatever you might call them in season two was so much better than that stupid guy at the end. Wait, of season I haven't one. finished season two though. Yeah, he's I have still, not either, well, but I don't if, mind. He's only three episodes in. Just say, yeah, the villain's way better. For, just leave it at yeah, that. for season two, the villain is really cool and really realistic, and it felt like it was just pulled right out of the show. But in season one. Uh, the the guy that kidnaps Clementine or whatever yeah. that whole plot line was the most ridiculous shit I've, I've ever seen it was like <laughs> I, why would yeah. you want to kidnap a little girl to take care of in the zombie apocalypse oh, I'd be yeah. like getting rid of little girls I yeah. think it's I think it was like un, like pedophile undertones is what I felt. yeah it was I, uh, I, just, I think he was just crazy and he like went crazy because he lost his family I don't and even so remember him though to, like when yeah, I think about yeah, season was, one I think about Clementine and uh, and what's his face can't even remember his name. Lee. Um, Lee. Lee. Yeah, Lee Everett. Uh, I don't really think about the villain. That was kind of weird that they're just mm-hmm. like thrown in at the end. So. Yeah. John, were you uh, speaking about Carver just a second ago? Yeah. The villain. Yeah. So I've at, at least encountered him and like 
oh, okay. been involved with him. So yeah, he's definitely a, a bad dude. Um, a lot of a lot of good voice actors. Uh, Kumail Nanjiani um, is in this. Carver is played by Michael Madsen. Um, there's a couple others and uh, really good voice cast. So uh, I'm playing curious. that. Go ahead. When you do finish, I'm curious. Uh, you have to let me know the choice you make at the very end. Obviously, I won't spoil it for you now, okay. but I'm, I'll be curious to see what you do compared <laughs> to what I did. I will say that I chose to help Sarah pick her blueberries. Okay. So. When you're on the roof and she's getting yelled at. Oh. Yeah, in the in the roof garden, you know, with uh, oh. one armed Freddy or oh, whatever yeah. his name is. One I didn't. Jack. Yeah. I treated that little girl like shit. I was like, you just need to go. Cause Me you too. Go. I was like, bye, Felicia. I was just yeah. like, get the hell out of here. <laughs> Damn. I told you um, I was heartless in this game. It's one of the few Telltale games I haven't played yet. The, like you were saying before, Dominic, the first one, like, everyone told me it was going to be pretty impactful, but it really didn't leave much of an impact on me just because of that weak villain at the end. I really wasn't a big fan of that. Yeah, exactly. And then it carried over. I never played season two, but I have played the Game of Thrones one. Tales from the Borderlands was awesome. I'm looking forward to the Batman one. It's going to be cool. So uh, besides that, I didn't play a whole lot of other stuff. I played some Vita, uh, played Entwined on Vita, which is the game from either last year's E3 or the year before that was at Sony's conference, and it came out that day. And it's all about the... uh, the, these two animals, I don't even remember what they are, but they're you're guiding them with the two analog sticks and making them uh, fly certain patterns. And uh, it's a short game. The mechanics aren't perfect. It's I wouldn't say it's anything super special, but it's, since it's short, I'm just kind of enjoying it when I'm watching TV or whatever on the Vita. And uh, besides that, I have been reading, uh, rereading, I should say, the Harry Potter books in anticipation of the uh, screenplay that's coming out in book form for, it's technically kind of like the eighth book. So, um, yeah. Warner Brothers actually thing. claimed rights to that today. The Cursed Child. Yeah, they, they filed a trademark for a film version, but yep. that'll uh, probably have to come after this Fantastic Beast trilogy. Yep. So, uh, Dom, what have you been playing? So I put in about an hour and a half, maybe, to into uh, Syndicate. Yes. It's really cool. I like the setting a lot. Um, I like it. Like, the characters are really interesting. I just finished those first two, like, intro missions. So I'm, like, just now getting to – actually getting to London. Um, but the first thing I, I, like, notice is, like, when I start playing is this still controls, like, shit, really. <laughs> I mean <laughs> – and, and then Jordan mentioned that this is actually, you know, controls much better than the last couple entries because I haven't played in an Assassin's Creed game since uh, Revelations. And I loved all of them up to that point. Um, I tried Black Flag for a little bit, but then I just got really bored of sailing. It got old really fast, so I put that down. But yeah, yeah the setting the setting in Syndicate is much cooler, um, but it's still not the... I guess I'm spoiled having played so much Dark Souls where the third-person huh. controls are just on point. But Is so, it yeah. that you're doing the thing where like you're jumping off places when you don't want to or... You're trying to go one place, but it, your character's going another place. Yeah, that stuff. it's a little bit of everything. It's just maybe I just need to get used to it again. I'm sure you know as I keep playing, I'll get more acclimated in, and it'll be you know a little easier. But there's just one observation. Back in uh, Revelations, you didn't have like the downward parkour, which is huge. Yeah. Also, I think it's one of those things like if you're an Assassin's Creed fan, as as the series goes on, you're a little bit more forgiving on that. Kind of like with like Uncharted and the shooting mechanics, like everything out about uh, everything else about that game you love so much that you're kind of willing to forgive like the shoddy parts of the game. So I think right. with Assassin's Creed, you know, it's just like if you love that series, you just kind of put that to the wayside and don't really think about it that much. Yeah, I, I'm. It's you know a small you know negative Gripe. point. Yeah. Overall, I think I'm really gonna like it, but more on that later because I put the most of my time into Skyward Sword this week actually. Oh well, wow. which this is a long game um, as far as Zelda games go. Huh. I'm close to the end now. I just got like the bow and arrow finally. I think I'm just about to, you know, get to the second to the last dungeon, I believe. But and it's such a shame too because I'm still feel the same way I did when I first talked about it a few weeks ago that the motion controls completely, you know, ruin this game because there is a good Zelda game in there. Yeah, not a great Zelda game um, by their standards, but you know, there's still a good game in there. That's just yeah, the motion controls just ruin it for me. It's 
my complaint I just had about controlling everything in Assassin's Creed, it's ten times worse than that. <laughs> <clears throat> when it does work in your, you know, sword fighting, it feels great, but it seldom actually works. And then there's a bunch of other like stupid little things you have to do with motion that are just annoying. Yeah. Um, so would you rank it like at the bottom of the Zelda list? So far, yeah. Um, as far as like the mainline uh, 3D Zeldas go. Okay. Huh. Is that everything you played? Is that it? And actually, also, I played Monument Valley on my phone. Really nice. cool. Game. Yeah. Awesome. Playing in a mobile game. Um, yeah, I know. That wasn't Pokemon Go this week. That's that's uh that's rare. Uh, what about you, Jordan B? How's how's it going this week? What did you play? Uh, so the biggest thing has been Pokemon Go. Obviously, I don't know if any of you have gotten sucked into that, but I was pretty. I haven't heard of that it. game. <laughs> right. <laughs> it seems like it's you can't avoid it. And, uh, but um. I didn't want to play it. I played it for like an hour, and it was all buggy, and it crashed a lot, and I was like, I don't get this. And then I had a lot of my friends playing it, and then I picked it up, and then I was like, I get this. And it turns out tons of people on Long Island are playing it. It's just been more fun to go out and actually like do things face-to-face with people uh, for once with gaming. So, I mean, it seems like a pretty positive thing, but that's pretty much been what my week has mostly consisted of. But on the side, I've gotten some Grand Kingdom in. Uh, I just picked up Odin's Fear on the Vita. That's been a lot of fun. Nice. Uh, I picked up Song of the Deep yesterday at GameStop. Figured I'd give that one a try. It's been getting pretty good reviews, and I like Insomniac. And as always, uh, you guys don't know, but I play Battlefield 4 all the time, so that's I'm always back in on that oh, game. Wow. I really love that. Still still stuck sticking with me. I love all the dice games. I'm like one of the few people that actually liked Star Wars Battlefront. So, Well, oh, there's huh. one right here too. Yeah, Dumb. finally. <laughs> oh, yeah, right? I, I platinum. It was like the most – it was the best day. I was so happy. But uh, I love that game. I love all the dice games. I think they're really well made, and it, I think it's unfair when people criticize them. But that's just me, personally. But. <laughs> um, so, Jared, I think you should now refer to Jordan B. as the scourge of Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> um, Instead the, of the pride of Long Island. Let's, uh, let's get into the news here. The first story um, is something that people were wondering if it was going to be the case with PlayStation Neo. But uh, Xbox has come out and stated... Um, this is from Eddie over at GameSpot. Like we talk about every week, he's the only one that writes stories, I guess, over there. Um, seems like his name's on every story. Uh, Xbox One Scorpio getting trade-in programs from retailers. Microsoft is calling Scorpio the most powerful console ever made. Uh, Microsoft is working with retailers to offer trade-in programs for the new, more powerful project Scorpio. Many retailers, including GameSpot, uh, GameStop, already offer such programs for other systems, allowing you to pick up new hardware for less money. Um, and then they basically talk to Microsoft Sage McCarthy about why they're doing this and he talks about obviously it's good for gamers, yada yada yada. Um, what do you guys think about this trading program for Scorpio? Do you think it's smart? Yeah, I think this is exactly what Sony needs to do with Neo. And you kind of just have to swallow your pride as a company and kind of get over the fact that you're going to have to work with a third party retailer in order to secure this deal. But I think it's totally worth it. If you really want like a large group of your audience to upgrade, especially with these iterations, right? Like you want to get console gamers who are not familiar with this approach to technology, get used to it. And the best way to do that is to trade it in, give them incentives. Maybe later on you don't really offer the trading programs, but to get people used to this this iteration process, I think it, you, it needs a little bit of hand holding, some training wheels, right? Especially when it's this early in the generation. Yeah. So. I remember reading in the article that it said, you know, they were working heavily with, you know, the the retailers, yeah, the GameStops and Best Buys and everything. So I think these retailers are obviously going to take a big brunt of the cost of these, right? Yeah. Um, of paying people back or however. Because they want attachment rates. They want those attachment rates up. Right. So I mean, it's a good idea, and obviously it's great for the consumers. But I I just think it's interesting because I remember Microsoft is like famous for doing trade in. Like if you have a MacBook, you can trade it in like at a Microsoft store. For yeah. a hefty amount of money, if you're putting it towards a Windows laptop, so it would be cool if they did this directly. If you could, you know, send your, you know, go to the Microsoft store, not not a GameStop, yeah, because they're probably gonna have the worst buyback. Let's be honest. Yeah, um, they always do. <laughs> yeah, so good idea though. Good thing. Um, this. A couple Christmases ago, when we got our Xbox One, um, we traded in our 360 through Microsoft to get a hundred dollars off the Xbox One. And uh, they were actually uh, accepting PS3s as well. As well. Yeah, yeah. So if they uh, if they accept PS4s for this, that'll be huge too. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can you imagine? That'd be genius. Yeah, and, and there's kinda, plenty of like, PS4s out there. Sorry, yeah. go ahead, Jordan. <laughs> it, it's kind of like from like I remember when the PS4 and Xbox One first came out. All pretty much all of the AAA games that were on both consoles had like if you bought them on PS3 or Xbox 360, you could pay a ten dollar charge and they would oh, yeah. give you the uh, upgraded one for free so i mean it's definitely not a new thing that they're doing and i think it i think uh, it should probably be like a one month thing like when the first consoles first come out if you really want to upgrade like i mean that way it also gives some incentive to make the sales and like at and, full price know, yeah yeah and it won't give people like the advantage of doing that the, all the time yeah i think it be, like, i remember that thing. i remember that because i bought uh call of duty ghost for like 30 dollars used on ps3 and then popped it in my PS4 and paid the ten bucks. <laughs> Had a sixty dollar game for like forty bucks. I ended up, it sucked that I didn't even hardly play it, but yeah. I think a, another big thing that you're gonna like the type of people that they're gonna be catching here is um, obviously this will be a limited time offer if they do have this uh, trade in program. So uh, you have to think instead of people going, oh well, I've got my Xbox One. It plays all the games. They still look great. I'm not itching to upgrade but if it's this limited time thing where you can trade in that xbox one and get you know this the xbox big boys it's known here on our podcast then you'll get more people upgrading earlier that way yeah i agree um the next couple stories here are really quick not too much to talk about but uh so the first thing i found over at reddit actually on uh reddit uh slash r slash gaming where you can find a bunch of really cool stuff i suggest if you don't keep up with personalities this is a good place to find out about gaming and stuff happening um i i sent this over to the guys there's a blog a dev blog for these game developers it's two guys and they're making this solo adventure game where you play as a cat in this like very futuristic um japanese like tokyo inspired walled city um, and it's made by two guys in, in the south of France. Um, they're not accepting donations, and so they're not doing Kickstarter or anything, and they're not having early access. Um, they just want to focus on making the game. Uh, I sent the link to you guys before the show. Uh, the game looks beautiful, in my opinion. Like, what do you guys think? Do you think this has uh, some uh, some capabilities, some chances to be a really like cool game? Some it, potential. Yeah. It looks good graphically. It looks superb. Um... I, I just need to see more. I guess it's just this cat walking around. I so. like how he jumps up on the like on the the pipes though. It looks really cool. It's like a very weird like third person camera like off to the side like a little bit off kilter. It looks interesting. Um, that is something cool to check out. Um, so the next story here is actually a follow up on Game Informer to uh, our, our our story we talked about last week with CS Go Lotto and the whole controversy with T Martin and Pro Syndicate. Um, Mike Futter over at Game Informer writes, Valve to demand gambling sites using Steam login uh, to cease operations. Uh, Valve is about to get tough on gambling sites built on tradable Steam items. The company has been facing scrutiny after popular YouTubers are found to violate disclosure rules. Um, in the coming days, Valve will be sending notices to gambling sites that trade in Counter-Strike, uh, Global Offensive, CSGO, skins, and other items. While the company doesn't specify how it will pr- pursue these sites, should a cease and desist not do the job, Valve implies that it will use uh, other means to isolate itself from the gambling operations. So essentially, Valve, like we were talking about uh, last week, I was saying that Valve is actually pretty guilty for this as much as those guys are for allowing this to happen. And it seems like now that you know people are jumping on him, they're like, oh, no, 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 we don't agree with this. Um, so what do you guys think? This is a good call for Valve. Do you think they should have done this before you know bad things actually happened? Like, Where do you guys stand on this? It's, it's, it's tough to say. It seems like it's something that's very community-driven. Uh... I guess maybe it was something like that kind of happened from a good idea of implementing the skins because I was definitely addicted to buying those skins. They're fun to get and everything like that. Uh, I guess the community itself kind of made it a malicious kind of activity. So I don't necessarily put all the blame on Valve. I think they were just lazy with keeping track of what was happening. um, And now it's kind of bitten them in the butt. Uh, But I think as long as they kind of take the problem head on i don't think it's a super big deal i think it's more of a big deal what the youtubers were doing to uh, their fan bases and the community itself i don't think it's i think valve was just kind of lazy about it yeah uh sloppy bookkeeping essentially and it's good that they're actually being proactive about it now um they could have easily just done nothing about it but um yes yeah, so not too much to say about that the next story here came as a surprise to me being somebody who owns an xbox and leans more microsoft to, uh, than sony but actually like both quite a bit um this comes by way of Game Informer as well. Mike as well. Uh, two stories back to back here. Um, Microsoft will not hold Gamescom press briefing. Uh, last year, Sony bowed out of Gamescom press conference in favor of Paris Games Week. This year, Microsoft is following uh, suit, leaving behind a staple, the biggest trade, uh, 
leaving behind the staple of the biggest trade event in Europe. Microsoft will still have a presence at the show, but will be shifting its focus towards fans instead of talking to the media. The company has announced plans for a fan fest similar to what it holds at E3. There are no details yet, but the public-facing event will be held during Gamescom. If you're attending the show in Cologne, Microsoft will uh, have a booth in Hall 8. Uh, there you can check out uh, what they have, including Gears of War 4, Forza 3, Halo Wars 2, ReCore, and the list goes on and on. Uh, games play, uh, Gamescom will take place on August 17th. So what do you guys think about uh, Xbox not having a presence at Gamescom? Is this weird? More room for Nintendo and the NX. <laughs> yeah, <true. laughs> if I feel true. like, uh, obviously, you know, Gamescom isn't going off a cliff or anything like that, but it is kind of odd that Sony drops out one year. Sony more because they were doing, uh, they were basically just switching their Gamescom preference to Paris Games Week, but I'm wondering if Microsoft is going to have something to substitute there. Well, I think, so, Gamescom is a, a lot more public-friendly, like, conference. Obviously, yeah. it's it's a lot easier to get in. It's public, so people are able to walk in. So I think that maybe these companies are understanding that you don't need the press conference there. P- play, people will just go to play your games. Like, you have people, not media, not these people that are going to write a story about your game. You have people, normal, everyday people, that just want to play your games. And I think that they're noticing that maybe a conference is for E3, is for the Paris Games Week, is for the PSX, if you have your own event, obviously. Mm-hmm. And I think that they see that Gamescom is a public event, so they want to be more fan-facing as opposed to media-facing. So They also just might not have things to show, necessarily. Like, yeah. I feel like they've kind of put all of their chips on the table already for the upcoming holidays and the uh, first and second quarter of spring. So they could also just be that maybe they just don't have any new trailers or anything to show. They just want their developers to work on the games instead of making these trailers that they can show off to the public because I guess we pretty much know what they're coming out with uh, during the holidays now. So yeah, maybe true. that has something sure. to do with it as well. I mean, I know what, like Sony hosts uh, PSX near the Game Awards. So, I mean, it's all weird like that. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you want to say something, Dom? Yeah, no, I think that's a big part of it too is there's just nothing le- – they kind of blew their load already, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. I would love if they came out and had a conference where they had, you know, like five or six teaser trailers for games that don't come out in two years. Yeah, that's the dream. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm making, fun of, I'm making fun of PlayStation. It was a PlayStation Kojima. Show. Okay, okay. Um, hey, yeah, Death Stranding's coming out this fall, dude. I, people who are, people, did you see the amount of people that pre-ordered that game? It's insane to me. I'm like, you realize you're not getting that game for a long time, right? Yeah, it's just, a PS6 you just made a donation. Game. Yeah, exactly. They, yeah. You funded their Kickstarter. Um, <laughs> the last item here comes from, by, by way of The Verge, but it's all over the internet, um, by Andrew over at The Verge. Uh, Nintendo is releasing a miniature NES with 30 built-in games. Uh, it's coming out in November, $60. Uh, if you've seen an NES before, it's essentially the same thing, except like a mini version. It's like the size of a Lunchable. Um, shout out to Lunchables. Uh, so <laughs> he writes here, Nintendo is bringing back the NES, only a little smaller. Today the company announced that what it's calling the Nintendo Entertainment System NES Classic Edition. Jesus, is that a Square Enix title? It just looks like an NES, only a lot tinier. Um, it has ports on the front. It comes with a controller. You can also buy a secondary controller for $10. And I'm going to give you guys the list of games. Uh, it's also going to have HDMI support. Um, so, right here, the list is as follows. Let me just go and find it. Here we go. So, we have Balloon Fight, Bubble Bobble, Castlevania, Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest, Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., Double Dragon 2, Dr. Mario, Excite Bike, Final Fantasy, Galaga, Ghost and Goblins, Gradius, Ice Climber, Kid Icarus, Kirby's Adventure, Mario Brothers, Mega Man 2, Metroid, Ninja Gaiden, Pac Man, Punch Out, Star Tropics, Super C, Super Mario Brothers 1, 2, and 3, Tecmo Bowl, The Legend of Zelda, and Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. I think it's a deal. If you just if you mark those games at $2 a piece, you're making your money back, you know? Um, I think there's a lot of fantastic games on this list. I don't know about you guys. What do you guys feel? Is this value? Is this weird that, that's coming out at this time? It's, 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 very, it's very weird. It's a very Nintendo thing to just Here. one day at 7 a.m. Eastern time to announce via Twitter, <laughs> yeah. first yeah. of all. Um, it's I don't know it's it's cool it's a cool little thing that I can see like people like taking to places right like it's something you can just plug in really quick and play a couple games or whatever yeah but it still it still harps back to that age old question of why can't they just <clears throat> make the entire um, NES and SNES libraries available for eShop purchase like completely across the board I mean even throw them on the other consoles too I don't know like. That would be where they could really make money if that's what they're but interested they, in. They know nostalgia sells, though, so they're like, we'll just make a mini NES. Like, look how crazy people went over the PlayStation, the the, the classic uh, throwback 
Remember the PlayStation Four? Mm-hmm. So it's like people uh, yeah. love yeah. nostalgia. So um, I think it's weird for me to make it smaller and compact. You guys know what I'm talking about the um, the very cheap like game things you can buy like at a flea market that are like 15 bucks and you plug it in and it has like snake and like a bunch of like rip off like this it has 10,000 games on it yeah yeah that's what this gives me the vibes of obviously all the games in there are fantastic but I don't really like the packaging they're using it's a weird gripe but like Europe's packaging for this looks way better than America's yeah ours looks very tacky and like Nintendo's usually yeah. really good at their packaging I like the packaging they use it's usually very clean very colorful um but like this is it's very tacky it looks like I bet it I thought it looked cool. It was kind of, like, retro-looking. I didn't like it, <laughs> me personally. But, uh, yeah, uh, do, do you guys think it's $60 is a steal? You think it's a I do. I'm, I'm super hype on this. I think I think there's going to be so many gamers buying this just because, um, yeah, you get 30 games. You get this little NES console. I think it's dumb that it can't play NES cartridges. I think that's kind of weird. But uh, other than that, uh, it's... I think it's really pretty cool, and for the price, you're you're getting some sweet game in action. Yeah, uh, Jordan B. Does this? You know, there's been rumors that the NX is supposedly a digital only console, which they've kind of refuted. But it, now, now that they're doing this kind of console where all these games are digital on it, do you think that you know Nintendo's leaning more towards a, a digital focus? They'll obviously have physical games, but do you think they're learning that you know the the way of the future is digital? Yeah, I think they're experimenting a lot at this point. It seems like uh, Pokemon Go and their whole going into the mobile market seems like a giant experiment to see where they should go next. I think with uh, Iwata's unfortunate passing, uh, I think the company is definitely having a new restructure with the new president, and they're going to try a lot of different things. I also think that this NES console is being released in big part because of um, the fact that they don't have a super big lineup. I was doing some oh, research yeah. while you were talking about it um, and I'm not really seeing anything in regards to the Wii U that looks super interesting. They have a few big 3DS titles but I definitely feel like this seems like a interesting holiday product that could definitely like aim more towards the general uh, audience that grew up with the NES. So a lot of adults will probably pick it up for their kids and stuff. They don't have a lot of big games so this is definitely a way to drive revenue and things like that. That's a really good point because yeah, they have mm-hmm. a huge gap yeah, Even exactly. Start, this whole year has just been barren for them. So yeah, they they need something to bring in some revenue during this time. While we wait for NX. Also, who knows if this wasn't supposed to come out earlier in the year? But because they had to push NX, they pushed this too. So instead of this coming out earlier in the year, maybe when they push NX, they're like, well, we can hold that for release. You know, when they're mm-hmm. thinking about their plans for the rest of the year at the beginning of the year. Obviously, we don't just know. Just tweet but... about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, to your point, you were saying if they're going all digital, um, I think they might be. Uh, I can't. I can't really say for sure because I, I really can never read that company because I feel like they're so no out there. Can. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> as opposed to Sony and Microsoft. I mean, I think we're headed to an all digital future. Unfortunately, I like my physical copies, but I'm. I have a Steam library of over like 300 games, so I'm definitely adept to going all digital. It won't be a super bad thing but i'd rather stay physical but i think nintendo i could definitely go all digital with their new console it wouldn't surprise me yeah it almost seems like nintendo listens to as many gaming podcasts as they possibly can and then as soon as someone says i hope nintendo does this they're like yeah we're, we're definitely not doing that just do the exact <laughs> opposite of what they just said yeah um also going to your point of like why people buy this i think a lot of people who so we we're growing up in an age now where a lot of people who grew up as gamers are having kids right um yeah like actually playing like solid video games. I think that this is a way of them like uh how would I say this? So like we grew up with our parents owning if your parents did play video games, owning the classic systems. A lot of kids now their parents were that second generation where we started playing video games. So I think it's harder for them to be like, "Hey dad, can I play your NES?" cuz a lot of us don't really own NESs and stuff like that. So this is a way of like, you know, I was able to play this as a kid. It's hard to scramble up everything because cartridges can get expensive or rare. This is a way to get all the games I want you to play to get introdu- introduced to video games in a single box, you know? It has a lot of staples. It has a lot of really good games, so... Um, it definitely I mean, covers those parents that always talk about, should I start my kid on the latest gen or make him go back to, like, the 8-bit? It's like, if you want to do the 8-bit thing, the 8-bit education, as they call it, you can just put your kid in front of one of these machines and they got 30 awesome games to go through. Yeah, awesome. Um, so we're going to be getting to the topics here. Uh, we were talking about Nintendo and uh, you know, earlier in the show, Journey, you said you've been playing Pokemon Go. So what's your topic for us, our guest topic? 
So my guest topic, I basically just wanted to talk about how Nintendo can kind of shove themselves back into the market seemingly out of nowhere. Um, they tend to do that a lot, like they did it with the Wii, I think, because the GameCube didn't sell very well, I mean, compared to the PlayStation 2. Um, I just think it's crazy how a company like that has such powerful IPs, but their hardware always seems to be a little step behind. So I, I was kind of wondering just like – do you? guys think that like microsoft or sony could ever do anything on the scale of this do they have the potential to do that and like what does this mean for the future of nintendo and gaming in general um, well you, sorry, you saw this you saw this what was it last year when activision blizzard bought what were they called king gaming or something you know a yeah. mobile studio they paid like six billion dollars yeah the yeah. guys buying candy the, crush yeah the candy crush people so yeah some other uh publishers are already going that way i think uh, sony and microsoft will hop on this bandwagon eventually too. I mean, there's so much revenue to be gained there. And these are the people that make games the best, right? These mobile game makers are just throwing shit out there a lot of the time, but yeah. Um, so going to your point, you were saying, do, do Sony and Microsoft have the IP to do this? I don't think so. I don't think nobody, no one has the IP that Nintendo has that resonates with as a general of an audience. Um, yeah. You know, I think that like, and that's, I think that's the worst part. That's why people get so mad at Nintendo because, we all have common interest in Nintendo. We have games we love, whether it's the classic Mario and or Zelda or even Smash. Like, we have ties to this. And the sad thing is there's kids, going back to the issue with their new NES, mini NES, there's kids growing up nowadays that aren't going to have that nostalgia, that aren't going to be attached to Nintendo. And they're like, well, why should I be attached? They don't really make consoles that I like, you know? So it's, it's, it's troubling. And it's, it's just crazy to me that they can release a mobile game that changes the way society's working for a week you know like, yeah and I, I think just to say quick um when you even see i know ign uh, a bunch of people were reporting on this i read ign's article that they were saying like nintendo expected to sell 100 million we use they've only roughly sold 10 million so it's just interesting when you compare the that mobile market that is just blowing up right now as opposed to their uh, hardware market yeah and think about this think about the attach rate of mario kart i honestly if if, if xbox and or playstation would have came out and did the same thing that that uh, Nintendo did with the Wii U. I don't think they would have even gotten close to 10 million units. I think Nintendo is lucky enough to have that many units sold, and it's because of their IP. Um, you know, you hear almost on every podcast with people who want Nintendo to succeed, put a Pokemon like a legit Pokemon RPG on console on your console, and it'll sell units. And this shows right here with Pokemon Go, like make a Pokemon mobile game and it sells. You know, like it's they they have some of the most powerful IP and. It's, I, I think it's as much of a weakness as it is a strength for them. I think that that's why they don't really, they take a different approach with their consoles is because they know, in their minds they think, well, you know, people love our IP so much that we can go for gimmicks, we can try new things because our our IP is always there. And I think sometimes that's a weakness for them because they they sometimes it seems like they lean too heavily on their IP. Um, and I think if their IP wasn't as strong, maybe they would. Uh, go for a more quote unquote traditional console experience. So, as much of a strength as it is for them, I think it sometimes is a crutch or a weakness. So. They don't even have to do Pokemon RPG. I just need a Pokemon Coliseum remaster. Ooh. And I'm in. Pokemon Snap 2, dude, I'm in. Day one, pre ordered. I love Pokemon Snap personally. <laughs> um, yeah, I just. I, I've been playing Pokemon Go too. It's really fun. It gets you out. It gets people learning their environments. Obviously, people are trying to make a big case of like people taking advantage of it and the whole people that were like luring people and like, you know, uh, scamming them or like mugging them. That's just crappy people being crappy. The, the, if there was a different avenue that wasn't a Nintendo mobile game, they would have found the way to do it, you know? Um, but like as much positive as uh, like impact this is having on society is awesome. People are going out more. People are hanging out with friends. People are finding new friends. Um, people are just having a good time, you know, and, uh, I think that it's a really cool thing that we live in an age where there's a Pokemon mobile game and hundreds of thousands of people from the ages of, you know, five to 35 are out catching Pokemon. It's cool. I would have never guessed, you know, yeah. no, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's so weird because I think it's a steaming pile of shit. Like, I don't really <laughs> like it. I mean, as a game, it's, there's not, if you like Pokemon or whatever, it's going to be great, but it's so bizarre how much this is taking over everything. Like all yeah. my friends, parents and uncles and people who like would never go near a video game are just obsessing over this. Yeah. Then I get to work this morning and um, over the over the office wall to me is like a bay of like six or seven women in their 40s. And that's all they were talking about is Pokemon Go. Wow. Like, what's on earth? 
is yeah. going on. <laughs> uh, it's cool though like whether you like the game or not i think the social aspects of it are amazing like it, it's just so cool man and the funny thing is they, they're saying how powerful this is and I, I don't think anything i think this is like a bottle moment like it's i don't think anything else will be able to capture this to the same like zeitgeist but like you know i think nintendo sees like oh there's a lot of money in mobile like their stocks went up like crazy so i yeah there's probably mario some kind of mario thing in development and um a lot of people don't know pokemon go is made off of the back end of ingress their ar game that is sent i, yeah, I downloaded yeah. it just to check it out it's essentially the same thing except it's not pokemon um it's a lot more complicated uh pokemon go is essentially ingress watered down with a pokemon skin on it um and you can see where it gets obviously all of its tools and stuff from, but yeah. it was it was smart to put that and that together and make a uh, Pokemon Go. I think Ingress had a lot of potential, and they knew that you know having a creative or like a new IP won't get people in interested as much, but putting a Pokemon label on it, you know. So uh, yeah, I, I really have no not much more to say. I just like I really think that Nintendo's IP is super strong, but. Sometimes they lean a little bit too much on it. Do you guys have anything left to say about uh, Jordan's topic? I mean, I just think it's interesting that you, you were talking... I don't even know what Ingress is, but the fact that it was built off of the backbone of that game is interesting. Yeah, it's essentially the same thing. Uh, you've seen screenshots of Pokemon Go, right? So like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have your character, and then you see like you see a GPS of like your, your house and like your neighborhood and everything, right? Mm-hmm. Ingress is essentially the same thing, but it's like a... It's like a spy game or something. I didn't really get too much in. I downloaded it and clicked around and saw some stuff. And it uses your it uses the same like hot spots where you get like items and stuff that are Poke Stops. Like it's essentially do the same thing, just a little bit more watered down with the Pokemon skin. And it's amazing to check out because like that's why I was interested because everyone's like you can actually use Ingress to find um, like places around you um, yeah. in Pokemon Go. So Ingress has everything laid out that you can see already. Pokemon Go is more walking to find stuff like discover stuff on ingress it's already all laid out on your map so people are using ingress seeing where stuff is on ingress because it uses the same formula then going to pokemon uh, go and finding out where stuff is so it's pretty that's cool. even more interesting that's really cool yeah um i i just think this is this is uh once again between the, the miniature nes and like this pokemon go like this is essentially made up for I, I wouldn't say fully made up for the Wii U's failure, but like, Fuck have you no. seen? No, have you seen how much like uh, Nintendo stock has gone up? Well, yeah, it's made up in that sense, but uh, a whole generation of dragging gamers through the mud. No, no, no. Was, yeah, I'm not saying not from I'm not saying from like gamers' vision or like outlook, but monetarily astronomical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. didn't help their gamer loyalty as we like to talk about here on the show. Yeah. Um, actually, I think it's interesting. Actually, I was just thinking about this. I remember when Sony tried to really punch like the mobile market in the face when they released that phone that had like kind of the PSP layout of like the PSP. I had it. Yeah, the <laughs> yeah. I thought it was like, cool. Dude. It was yeah. never an adopter, but I just I think it's interesting. Even when you look at like st- today, Sony and Microsoft like really have no place in the mobile market when compared to like Apple and Android. Uh, so it's just interesting. I think. Yeah, like well, cool. we talked about it a couple episodes ago. Jordan and I were saying like. If Microsoft had a handheld, I think it'd be pretty cool. I don't think they'd ever go into that realm, but like, yeah, I do appreciate mobile gaming. There's just, I like my 3DS; it's enjoyable and everything. Um, but I would like something like powerful. Like Vita's cool and everything, but mm-hmm. I would really want something like super powerful um, for a handheld, which is kind of hard. I think as technology progresses, we can see that possibly. But um, yeah, I agree with you. Like Nintendo has mobile locked down; they had it with the handheld and now they're obviously getting into the mobile market and crushing it so yeah people uh, make jokes about that xperia play but the latest xperia play phones can remote play ps4s and you can uh use oh, yeah. bluetooth to hook up a dualshock 4 yeah, yeah. you get that little stand like, where it holds your phone above the controller yeah and it's like these are the biggest phones on the market so they're like like several inches larger than the iphone 6 plus mm-hmm. So we're gonna be closing out of this topic. Do you have any closing word for words for us, Jordan B? Any any thoughts? Just keep playing games. Don't fall into the mobile scam. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, all I gotta say. So our second topic here, uh, Jordan. What do you have for us? Other. Okay, Jordan. so <laughs> this yes, the artist for or podcaster formerly known as. Um, this week we're gonna be talking about. Uh, uh, whether or not uh, Sony and Microsoft have been able to bridge the gap uh, between their own sales and Steam sales, 
Um, over the years, they've been obviously trying to work a lot harder because Steam is is all digital. Sony and Microsoft have to worry about you know selling physical games in stores. So um, they've been trying to make their digital games really not cheaper at all. Uh, they cost the same at launch as a physical game would, but they're closing the gap as far as the sales go. So of course, Steam has uh, like seasonal sales that the internet goes crazy over. And people freak out about because they drop the prices so low of so many awesome games that you're just <laughs> buying stuff left and right, picking everything up that you've wanted all year, and it's kind of just a blowout. And so we just had um, Sony's uh, mid-year sale, which is essentially the summer sale. And uh, for me, it had a lot of great deals. Picked up a lot of games, probably at least like $50, $50 worth of games. Um and I definitely don't think that it's, uh, you know, like deals with gold or like the flash sales that Sony does. I definitely don't think they're completely rivaling the Steam sales because Steam has such a large library that they can drop the title or drop the price of so many uh, crazy titles. So um, they're definitely not like right up on the edge. But I just wanted to talk about how, to me, it seems like over the past few years they've been closing that gap uh, and working really hard to. Well, so for... For me, the you know the thing with PC that dominates consoles are the sales. Like you look at the Steam sales yeah. and it's like, God, this is Steam is the biggest enemy of anyone's backlog <laughs> because those sales <laughs> come out and you just buy, 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 buy. I have ten more games on my backlog. Um, yeah. The, I love I love that consoles are getting these sales. They used to have sales and they, it's not a brand new thing, but it seems like they're getting more into the making an event kind of thing, you know. Um, yep. For instance, the Xbox Ultimate Game Sale, which was from the 5th to the 11th of this month, fantastic. Um, they, you had Red Dead Redemption backwards compatible, $7.50. Batman Arkham Knight, $15. I'm trying to think of all... There was a ton of sales. Uh, really good games on sale to you. Um, and I, I I agree with you that I think they're getting... Cl- cl- they'll never directly compete. There's no way. But I do think that they're taking yeah. the best parts of what Steam does and implementing it well. Um, and I'm, I, it seems like there's sales a lot more often. Um, it's, it's hard because not only do PC gamers not have to pay a monthly online fee, they also get way better deals, you know? Mm. Um, so that's always the argument with PC gamers is like, I have way more sales than you. I can get a lot more games for a lot cheaper and stuff like that. And I don't have to pay to play online. So yeah, well the cost of your hardware pretty much offsets that. (laughs) True. (laughs) Agree. (laughs) Very valid point. Um, I do. I do think also that, you know, we've kind of mentioned the fact that there's certain parameters or certain things holding um, Sony or Microsoft back from being able to really rival these Steam prices. Retailers. I really think it's right. Yeah, Yeah, a a big part of it is brick and mortar and physical sales. But I think that these sales, you know, the changes have been going on for a couple of years now, making them way cheaper to where I think... You're going to get people that maybe they weren't originally during this console generation planning on going all digital, but they just bought so many through sales. And, of course, you can't just – there's no, like, PlayStation store that you could go to physically that would offer the same deals at the same time physically. So uh, I think there's just going to be people that are building up digital libraries almost by accident which is basically Sony and Microsoft like reeling people into a digital uh, their digital storefront. Yep, and their legacy on their consoles since we're going to this right. more iteration process for consoles and having your backlog, having the backwards yes. compatibility built in. So the, the one other piece that PC is always going to have the upper hand on, is, especially as far as these digital sales go, is Steam isn't the only place that you can buy PC games or even Steam yeah. games for that yeah. matter. Yeah. Yeah. So there's tons of competition. There's hundreds of other sites where you can buy – PC games or, you know, yeah. even PC games with Steam codes. Good old games, so, Humble Bundle, yeah. Exactly. So there's tons of those, you know, and that's what drives those prices down a lot. Um, some of them are shadier than others, but there's not really the same sort of thing on consoles. I mean, you can – I think on Amazon I've bought plenty of uh, 3DS digital codes, but oh, I don't gosh. know that there's much in the way of Xbox and PlayStation digital game retailers other than the PlayStation Store or the Xbox Marketplace. Yeah, so that's a big part. Buy of it. codes for most games like PS4, or Xbox One, on Amazon, but it's not quite as surefire as the physical game, and it's you know prices may vary as well, so it's different. Also, I think that um, 
the PlayStation and Xbox sales tend to be a lot more uh, cleaner, uh, for lack of a better term. Obviously, there's not as many games on, on PlayStation or Xbox as Steam, because right. it's impossible. So, like, when you go to those sales, there's a lot of really good sales. Don't get me wrong. Steam has hundreds upon hundreds of fantastic sales, but you also see, like, hot garbage on sale, too, you know? Yeah. So it's like, yeah. uh, what, is, what is all this? You scroll down until you find the stuff that actually matters. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that they're they're getting close, and um, I, I, I really do like your point of, like, people are accidentally building digital libraries on console, yep. uh, especially with, like, even the Games with Gold and PlayStation Plus Obviously, you only right. own those games if you still have it, but like that's building your library too. Uh, for yep. instance, Xbox, you're getting four games a month. You get the two Xbox One ones, as well as every 360 game that's on Games with Gold yep. is uh, already backwards compatible. Uh, backwards compatible. Um, so you get four games a month essentially on your Xbox One. So. And there's no physical alternative to those either, so yep. you, you really don't have a choice. What do you have to say about this, Jordan? Um, so I guess I might be like a small minority, but my issue with big sales on the PlayStation store is like, I'll tend to only buy like indie games because of how big, I'm sorry, how small the storage is on my PS4. I've had my PS4 since November, 2013, and it's filled up more times than I can count. So like Uh. a big thing with me is like, it takes a long time to download larger games. So I'm more inclined to buy indie games, which are, don't have physical copies anyways for like, a game, a sixty dollar game like Doom, I'd rather go out to the store so I could just pop the disc in. Typically, usually like a faster install if it has to update or anything. Oh. It's just kind of annoying I, in my mind. Like if I had to buy a game, download it, filled up, delete it, don't want to play it anymore. Like I bought Metal Gear Solid digitally, and it's like a forty gigabyte game, and like forty gigabytes takes a relatively long time in my house to uh, download. So it's one of the big reasons why I don't often buy large titles on their big sales, but I'll. Often get like games like Rogue Legacy or like Nidha games like that. I have a question oh. for you. So, have you? We were talking about this last week. One of our topics was PlayStation. Now, did you ever try the trial? I never did. No, it's I have a PS3 and I have tons of physical games for it. So, like most of the games I want to play on PS3 are pretty much backlog games. So I have no reason to go back and play many of them. If if you have trouble downloading, and your download speeds are slow, probably not going to be a good experience because I. Yeah. I tried it and it was awful. And I have the best internet, as I said, like I can get in my area, and I couldn't even. It was like three frames per second. So yeah, yeah. See, that's so interesting. It's all relative because, like, for me, I don't have I don't have a storage issue because I have an external hard drive. But you said the bigger issue is the internet. I have a really fast internet. Stuff downloads like super fast. So like, I never even think about think twice about how big is this game. You know? Yeah. So I have another like. I have another example, like Battlefield 4, is, I have it in my hands. It's 40 gigabytes minimum. When I want to play that game, because I was saying before how it's like a game that I often go back to a lot on PS4, uh, the only thing I ever have to download again is the DLCs. So if I ever have to delete that game and I pop it back in, it'll pretty much automatically install so I could just get back in and start playing it. If I had it digitally downloaded, that wouldn't be the case, and that's, like again, a big reason why I kind of strive away from uh, those sales unless like it's an in-store sale where I can go buy a physical copy or get something off Amazon. Yeah. Um, Jordan, what's your closing thoughts on this topic, the OG Jordan? So uh, the other Jordan makes some interesting points here that I wasn't even thinking about, just why you may or may not want to build this digital library or my why you may want to uh, stay away from these sales for certain reasons. Um, and you made some great points. Um, I think these sales... It's it's very clear to me that Sony Sony especially uh, Microsoft as well with uh, deals with gold and and some of the sales that they have uh, seasonally, but really Sony with their flash sales coming in uh, pretty often, I think they make it clear that they at least want to um, be in the running for your money when it comes to buying these digital games. Um, maybe they're not directly competing with Steam and the Steam sales, but I definitely think they're saying, you know, hey, you can get Witcher for 40 bucks on Steam or you can get it for 40 bucks on PlayStation. You know, what kind of controller do you want to play with? What kind of trophies and stuff do you want to get? So they're definitely at least uh, making the effort to grab your attention with the sales. So off of sales, we're going to be getting into Dom's topic here. Um one thing that bothers me is every time there's a sale, GTA on sale is still forty dollars. 
which I don't understand. It was Ooh. 38. It was 38 on PSN. Yeah, I still don't understand why that game's <laughs> still so expensive. Um, they make money hand over fist. That's probably why people still buy it no matter the price. But uh, yeah, so Dom, what's your topic? So yeah, that's exactly what I want to talk about. Grand Theft Auto. And there's, you know, I'll, I'll start in one spot and then we'll kind of let it morph into something totally different. So to begin, <laughs> the first thing I got to say is I've never played a Grand Theft Auto game. That is insane. It's just never been something that interests me. I totally respect them and what they do. I just – everyone who played Grand Theft Auto that I knew when I was a kid, they weren't exactly the people I wanted to hang out with, <laughs> if you know what I mean. You know, yeah. and these were the people that bought an Xbox and bought Grand Theft Auto and Madden, you know, yeah. and that was it. And that, that was the culture that was built around this game for me growing up in my town. You know, I mean that's just what it was. It wasn't really about, oh, it's so big and cool and, you know, the things that we give, you know, give positive regards to games nowadays – like, none of that really was around GTA. It was just, like, the game where you could just screw around, shoot down police helicopters, and kill hookers. <laughs> like, that's what it was. So I never was even slightly interested in it. It's never, it never clicked for me, I guess. Um, but people love it, and it, I just think it's weird. Um, that it, And the, the funniest part being that the entire game, the entire series is a satire on, like, American culture. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But those same people that it's making fun of are the people that buy the game for the most part. Yep. And they're they're getting made fun of as they play it, and they don't know it. I just always thought it was ironic, the way, the way that is. There, I mean, I, it's funny. I love that it's a satire, and they and that they you know they overdo things um, to make those points. But it was just this thing that it just was never for me, and I just always thought it was odd. Um, so I guess I mean you guys can just you know pipe in really quick each on what you thought of or what you like or don't like about GTA, but. Going off that, I kind of want to jump into, and this is a whole we could spend hours talking about this. Going into like, se- I think it should be a separate topic. I think the whole violence aspect. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think All that's right. a whole bag of worms that can be opened on another day. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's I do agree with you that growing up, the kids who played GTA were definitely the kids that my parents didn't want me hanging around with. Um, <laughs> I think that just goes harkens to the fact that it's a, it was a very general game in terms of the audience that it wanted to hit and i think it's no different than like sports games nowadays me personally i play sports games i love them but a lot of people who play sports games as sports games i wouldn't technically call hardcore gamers um yeah. you know and i think that's the same way with gta i played i'd play gta 5 beat it i play sports games i consider myself a pretty hardcore gamer i play a ton of other games but i think it just hits such a general audience the interesting thing is my actual first gta was gta 2 um the top down uh gta mm. Before it actually hit mass appeal, um, I like the GTA games a lot. I think they're fun. I think they're a very refreshing take on um, open world games. Uh, we play so many like sci-fi or fantasy or this kind of stuff. Um, it's the only modern-ish, action-ish, open world game that I like. Um, Saints Row is too cartoony for me personally. It's too out of the bag. Um, and like True Crime or those games, they're too. CSI E or Law and Order E, that makes sense. Um, I think that GTA has like a, a very good uh, culmination of the two. Um, I like GTA a lot. I think um, that it does have its issues. I think that the funny thing is all of the satire that it has in that game. You, you, you're perfectly right. The, the mass the mass market or the people that play that game are the people it's making fun of. But for people who kind of get those things and aren't really are more of the hardcore-ish gamer or people who just think a little bit more. When you see that stuff, it's funny, you know? Cause it, oh, it's brilliant, yeah. That yeah. game is one of those games that's it's as deep as you want it to be. Um, and I do think that they GTA definitely does have a place in gaming because they push games to boundaries that they should be pushed to for sake of being pushed to so people know what they enjoy or don't enjoy. There's a whole torture scene in GTA Five. a lot of people didn't like, and you can opt out of that. Um, so... Um, but it's there for people, and I think that, you know, video games are an art form, and there's plenty of different forms of art, and I don't think GTA is as brutal, mindless violence as people make it out to be. I think that's, you know, the player holding the controller is at fault there with the tools they're given, not necessarily the workshop with the tools in it, you know, so. So, if you've ever seen, what I, what I, I just, it was a revelation, it just came to me, if you've ever seen The Wolf of Wall Street, GTA reminds me exactly of that movie. Um, if you've seen it, it's it's the same kind of thing. It's a satire of this guy's life, and essentially the whole movie, he's just a billionaire, like 
doing all sorts of drugs and getting with tons and hundreds of hookers and girls. It's just ridiculous, right? And it's basically making fun of his life and why that doesn't work and why it doesn't why that won't make you happy. And that's the whole point of the movie. Um, but like college kids have just sucked it up and loved it for what it is. That's the life I want. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And they look so, at it that way. I'm like, no, that give he's me making some fun quaaludes. of you. Yeah. Uh, you don't get it. He's making uh, fun of this life, not endorsing yeah. it. <laughs> I just, that's what GTA reminds me of in a lot of ways. A lot um, of people don't see what it's really about. I want to hear the Jordan's takes on GTA. What, what's your guys' experience? Have you guys played them? Yada, yada. Um, so going off of something you said earlier, Jared, uh, this is not necessarily needs its own topic, but you were talking about how even when GTA goes on sale, it's still like 40 bucks and it's a super old game. I just wanted to mention the fact that both on the PSN store and Xbox live, um, like, especially if you're buying like Xbox 360 games or PS3 games, there's these random old games, like, uh, let's say Assassin's Creed three, Special edition on PS3 is still probably like seventy dollars or something. Yeah, I love so seeing I those like, in Walmart. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I just feel like the uh, especially for the digital stores, I think they should, you know, the publishers and the first party should take better care of being like, okay, this is an eight year old game. Let's take it down from sixty to forty or twenty or whatever. And GTA is a great example of that because yeah, it's like it's. A three or four year old game that's now been remastered on this console and even when it's on sale it's still like forty dollars so i totally agree mm-hmm. with that um and that's just a weird kind of nitpick thing i have with these digital stores but um yeah i haven't ever played uh gta really i've played a little bit of sleeping dogs and then of course we just got uh some free saints row for ps plus this month okay. uh, so i'll try that out but uh it's not necessarily my kind of game. Uh, as far as open worlds go, I'd rather be in uh, a more fantastical uh, area, I would say, and something that is a little bit different from just everyday life. Um, and then um, kind of like the same with Call of Duty, there's a lot of times when I think those games are kind of just filled with mindless violence that isn't necessarily something I need out of a video game, so... I kind of just pass on them a lot. Um, do you think, to me, I think of GTA as of, like, violent Sims. Like, I really don't think GTA is too far from Sims games, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's I mean, how I look it, at it. It's not, for me, it's not like it's too violent or anything like that. It's just that... Um, for your personal taste, I, I understand. Yeah, there's, like, there's, you know, sometimes there's violence and good taste. and not, uh, not that the whole of GTA is in bad taste, just that... I feel like um, mostly just that it's not really a game that I've ever felt like playing, and um, most of the time there's games that I have more of an urge to play elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, Jordan B., what's your take on GTA, your experience? So I've played pretty much all of the GTA games, but I think what... What I think hardcore, I think when you talk to most hardcore gamers, most hardcore gamers aren't going to say their favorite game is GTA. But uh, when a GTA game comes out, it ends up being like the most popular game of all time. Like I think the yeah. fifth one has however many copies currently, so like 80, 60, or 80 million. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think what Second GTA does, Minecraft. yeah, I think what GTA does uh, that's kind of interesting is it kind of it, it's it's setting and everything about it is kind of very casual i think when people go into gp a lot of casual people buy gta because it's not a fantasy game it's not intimidating like that it's a it's a driving simulator it's a shooting simulator it's like you can get any kind of itch out of that and also i think we were talking before about how we don't have that much time to play games it's one of those games that you can buy and like go back to it like any time play with your friends play story missions drive around do all that stuff so i think it has a uh, wide appeal to a lot of people so like yeah. when you put gta if you're talking to a, a random guy on the street if you put gta next to skyrim he's probably gonna pick up gta because he has he's more into like you see his fantasy and he might be a little intimidated by that like i'm not gonna get the the premise or what i have to do where gta it's like you can drive you can shoot uh, i get this world this world is a world that i'm comfortable with and i know uh it's just like modern day america essentially um so i'm not a big gta mm. fan but i think that's uh, that's kind of the way I look at it with its sales and everything like that. It's the same thing with Minecraft. It's just very basic, easy to get into, uh, and fun to play with friends, and you could do a lot of stuff in it. So, yeah, that's kind of my take on GTA. Um, you you made a good point there, and I think, I think yeah, the, the uh, ease of access, like people see yep. that game and they're like, okay, I understand this, you know. Um, yeah. 
And uh, yeah, I think some people are uh, are intimidated by like fantasy worlds or stuff they just don't understand. It's like, oh, this is a dude that's a criminal. Sometimes I get that. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like for me, it's like action movies. Um, in Hollywood, like, um, not everyone's uh interested in like a fantasy movie or even a thriller or a horror movie. A lot of people go and see action movies. They're some. They're most of the time they're like the biggest box office hits Mm -hmm. because everyone's like. I don't know what I want to watch. Oh, there's this new movie with this dude that shoots a gun at people. You want to go watch that? Yeah, sure. You know, Jason Bourne. Yeah, so um, I think it, it, the way it hits mass appeal and stuff like that is super interesting, and it sells obviously. But as as I as I got more into like video games and talking to people who actually understand and care about video games, like you guys, for instance, um, a lot of people don't ever really talk about. GTA being like a, their favorite game, it's never in their top fives mm-hmm. or top tens. Yeah. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, so the last topic here, um, this is an interesting one. So we're going to be doing a video game quiz. Ooh. I have twenty questions on the docket. Little game on the table. So the way it's going to work: score. twenty questions. Uh, it's not individual; it's team based. You guys have to work <laughs> it as a team. Uh, I'm going to give you the question. Feel free to think out loud. It is a podcast. We want to hear you talk. Um, whenever one of you has the answer, uh, just you know, as a group, figure out if that's the answer you want to go with. Let me know the answer. Um, if you guys don't know the answer, we'll pass and we'll come back to it later. So let's just try to get to this as fast as we can. There's questions easing, uh, running from easy to hard. So uh, we're going to start off, okay? Everyone ready? Everyone got the rules? Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. First question. In the game Metal Gear Solid, who is the twin brother of Solid Snake? Liquid Snake, <laughs> brother. Okay. Uh, what is the name of the gang member that video game Grand Theft Auto San Andreas revolves around? Oh, God. <laughs> it's not Nico. Nope. That's or... Nico Bellic. That's GTA 4. So, Jordan B., you're the only one that could answer this, right? Have you I, I have Andreas? the image of the character in my head, but I have never No Googling, San by the way. I kind of went without saying, but um, we'll come back to that one. That one's a yeah, skip for now, okay? Pass. That one's a skip. Uh, number three, how many rows of aliens are there usually at the start of a Space Invaders game? Is it, is it five? <laughs> yep, you got it. Correct. Oh, yes. Nice, nice, <laughs> nice. Uh, ha- number four, how many square blocks is each game piece composed of in the game of Tetris? Four. Got it, yep. I'm yeah, a mess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, five, in the game Doom, which planet is the space marine posted to after assaulting his commanding officer? Mars. Yep. Number six. Which PlayStation 2 game released in 2003 was banned by several countries and implicated by the media in a murder due to its graphic violence? Um, oh, um, nope. It's, it's Rockstar. Oh, it's um. Yep. Oh, I know it. I know it. Manhunt. It's yep. Manhunt. Yeah. Ah, yep. yeah. Seven. Slade, Reese, Jericho, and Roland Kane are all characters in which game? Slade. I know it's Slade from Teen Titans. <laughs> <laughs> This one you guys might not get. I don't know if you guys Can even you repeat their names. It. Slade, Reese, Jericho, and Roland Kane. Uh, I I know the names. Can we? Is there like a hint? Is there a hint option? What, uh, what I'll give you guys. I'll give you. This is you guys only have three hints. So you want to use one of your three hints? Oh sure. shit! <laughs> Think Jurassic Park. Turok. Yep. Nice. Uh, that was just wow. a random guess. Give <laughs> it. Okay, number eight. Launched in North America in 1998, PlayStation Games opening. Uh, this PlayStation Games opening song is a Chemical Brothers remix of the Manic Street Preacher song "Everything Must Go." So this is a game that launched in 1998 on the PlayStation, and its opening song was a Chemical Brothers remix of "Everything Must Go." So Siphon I was four filter. years old. Yeah, this is a popular series. What did you say, Jordan? Siphon filter. No. Do you guys want to use one of your two hints? No. Damn. I think we should pass this one. You want to pass or use a hint? Your choice. Um, Can we come back to it later? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's a pass. Okay, we passed two of them so far. Two and eight. Uh, Number nine. Jumpman's goal is to save the lady from the giant ape in which 1981 arcade game? Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong, damn it. I always get that mixed up. Uh, Ten. Name five Halo enemy types. Covenant. Covenant's like... Oh, okay. Okay, Grunt, yep. Grunt, Jackal, Brute. What's the new guys? Who are the new um, guys? Pro, what are the pro, big guys called? They're, they're Protheans. The so you have Jacko, Grunt, Brute. Oh, Prometheans. Okay. Would the Rebels count? I mean, that's more like Super and, Halo lore. Uh, the Covenant. Hunters. Those big Hunters. Yep. The yep, Covenant Elites, I that's should five. say. 
Elites five as well. Yeah. Oh, um, elites. elites. Yeah. What? Okay. What classic beat 'em up game featured brothers Billy Lee and Jimmy, also nicknamed Spike and Hammer? Double Dragon. Yep. Noise. Jeez. Twelve. This guy's an encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> what 64-bit Sega system was a predecessor to the PlayStation and N64? Repeat the question. The Dream Cat. What 64-bit Sega system was a predecessor to the PlayStation and 64? Think of all the Sega consoles. Just name them. You're bound Genesis? to get it. Nope. It was Saturn? A, it was yep. like an, uh, Saturn, it was, yep. It was either Saturn or Dreamcast. 13. Which of these is not a ghost in the game Pac-Man? Stinky, Clyde, Blinky, and Inky. Stinky. Yeah, Stinky. Yep. 14. In which video game would you find the characters Brick and Mordecai? In which video game? Yep. Characters yeah. Brick and Mordecai. Borderlands. Yep. I was going to say Earthworm Jim. <laughs> 15. Which video game centers around a character named Shulk? Uh, Xenoblade, Xenoblade Chronicles. Xenoblade period works as well. Yep. Uh, this one's a, a, a softball. What does NES stand for? Nintendo, Nintendo Entertainment what? System. <laughs> yep. 17. This is for, I, I, I hope, Dom, this, Dom, you better get this question. Sully is said to have served in which brand of the armed services? Sullivan <laughs> from the Uncharted series? Yep. I don't know. Where they um, never talk about Marines? this, like, but once? Oh, the Air Force. It has to be the Air Force. Nope. No way. He flies a plane. It's the thing. He's the plane guy. It's the Navy. Nope. It's got to be the Navy. Yep, Navy. Yeah. Nice. Uh, night, uh, 18. What was the price of the GameCube at launch? Ooh, God. Was it 199 Yep, on the dot. Wow. That's why I got one, because it was the cheapest of all three consoles. 19. What vault do you start in in Fallout 3? 101. 101. Yep. <laughs> uh, last one. Name three Shovel Knight bosses. Actually, we're going to change it. Name five Shovel Knight bosses. Oh, God damn. Damn. Leg <laughs> Knight. Okay. Yeah. Tiny Knight or whatever you were telling me about? That doesn't – nope, doesn't count. Plague <laughs> Knight. Plague Knight? Uh, I only know that because of the DLC, damn it. <laughs> Who's the main villain? I, it's the Medusa looking – Well, minor villain. Minor the first guy you run oh, 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 God, what's his name? Is it Black Knight? Yep, that's two. Um, Shield Knight's his companion. That counts. I'll give you that. I said bosses, but that, you named three so I far. Named, meh. King Knight. Yep. And um, there's an ice guy. There's uh, an ice guy. There's a digging guy. Yeah, there's the a guy that guy is a the dwarf. guy that has tools. There's a guy that finds stuff underwater. I'm trying to give you guys hints. Uh, there's a famous no. Disney movie called Blank Island. Treasure Knight. Yeah, no, treasure, treasure, that's Treasure Planet. Yeah, well, Treasure Knight, though, is the character. I was giving you guys a, a hint towards it. Um, the other ones are Polar Knight, Mole Knight, Tinker Knight is the little guy. Tinker. Propeller Knight. Um, <laughs> I would have accepted the Enchantress, even though she's technically not a knight. And Spectre Knight are the ones you guys missed. Spectre Knight, that's one I couldn't think of. Okay, so you have two questions left, and you still have two hints. You can essentially get both of them. Uh, question number two. Uh, what is the name of the gang member that video game Grand Theft Auto San Andreas revolves around? Uh, I need a hint. So five was Trevor, Michael, and Franklin. Four yeah. was Nico. I don't know three. He rode a bicycle. San and no, not three. It's San Andres. Right. San Andres. Yeah. I know what the guy looks like. I can't remember his name. So though. give him a hint, Jared. Okay. Uh, his he went by initials. His name was two initials. J T. Close. T J. <laughs> yep. C J. C J. C J. So you have one clue left and one question left. Number eight, launched in North America in 1998. PlayStation's it's a play a PlayStation game that came out in 1998. Started Chemical Brothers song. Was it an exclusive? Yes. Um. Oh man, can we get? I don't I'll know give you a hint. It raced its way to people's PlayStation. Gran Turismo. Gran Turismo. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and that is video game. So we got all of them then. Yeah, this is something I actually want to do every time we have a guest for the first time. So when Jordan comes back, we won't do this maybe. But every time we have a guest for the first time, too bad. I didn't think of this when Blessing was on. Maybe next time it comes on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's fun. Uh, you got a lot of the questions right, Jordan. So Hell yeah. Good job on that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's why it was taking me some time because I was finishing the questions up. Um, 
yeah, thank you guys for watching episode twenty or watching on YouTube if you're watching it there, or uh, listening to the podcast on SoundCloud or iTunes. Um, we're gonna get into what we're gonna be playing for the week, and then we'll close out the show. Um, for me, gonna be playing some more Red Dead, and I'll see what else I I find that I'm gonna play. I don't want to make too many promises because I say something and then I end up getting into something else. Like I said, I was gonna get back into The Witcher, and then I picked up Red Dead and started playing that. So I don't know. Um, I want to start watching. There's a series that came out uh, t- comes out tomorrow on Netflix called Stranger Things, which yeah, from what I heard, yeah. it mixes all of the really cool '80s things of like uh, uh, Stand by Me and The Goonies and like horror tropes and stuff like that. It's supposed to be a really good show. I'm definitely gonna check that out on Netflix this week. And uh, Red Dead, and then whatever else falls into my lap. I might pick up uh, uh, something. I don't know. That's pretty much it. I don't know what else I'm gonna be playing. <laughs> uh, what about you guys? So for me, uh, I might get around to Persona. We'll see. You know, I'm kind of just kicking back on that one at this point. Yeah, no pressure um, anymore, huh? <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I am definitely going to be finishing up uh, Walking Dead Season 2. Um, let me think. Uh, I, Dom, did you ever pick up Fury on PS Plus? No, I'm not even subscribed actually right now. So. Oh, are you, Jordan? Uh, I am subscribed, and I did play a little bit of Fury. It's very good. Fury is cool, man. I'm I'm definitely going to get back to that. Uh, definitely a lot of Afro Samurai vibes. If oh, yeah. Oh, Afro yeah, for Samurai sure. fan, like, just a lot of throwbacks and, and call-outs to that series. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd like to get back to Fury, and um, it's probably about time to get back to uh, Witcher Blood and Wine. It's been a few days since I played that, so um, there's that, and like I said, I'm uh, reading Harry Potter and then um, or rereading Harry Potter, and then I just finished rewatching uh, season one of Mr. Robot. That is an incredible show that everyone should watch. I need and to see it. I need to watch they it. just aired uh, the first two episodes of season two last night, so I'll be watching that uh, probably tonight. Remy Malik was on the Tonight Show, wasn't he, with Jimmy Fallon? Um, he might have been. I'm not sure. Yeah, he's cool. I obviously everyone was introduced to him in the gaming world to, in Until Dawn. So, yeah. Oh yeah, he was awesome. Uh, fantastic. Um, what are you gonna be playing, Jordan? B. So I'm probably gonna get started on Odin Sphere for the PS Vita. Um, I'm gonna probably play some more Battlefield Four as always. Uh, probably gonna try and beat Song of the Deep, and then I want to finish up Star Ocean Five because I'm like 20 hours in and I feel like I'm pretty much right at the end of it. So that'd be nice to actually finish a JRPG for once. Um, <laughs> Good but luck. other than that, I'm probably gonna go see Lights Out. That's like the only movie I've been looking forward to for Ooh, a little while. Yeah. So definitely, I'm nice. into short films, and the director it's his first long feature length film, and it's based off his short film. So I'm very excited for the director and to see that movie because I'm hearing great things. Uh, but other than that, I'm excited to play Song of the Deep. Is it based? So, is it based on the internet video of like the hallway where the guy like turns on the light and turns? Yeah, off yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Same director. It's really cool. That's so, awesome. Jordan, you're a Battlefield fan and a DICE fan. Yeah. Uh, did you get into Battlefield Hardline at all? No, that was, I picked it up and I returned it and just continued playing Battlefield 4. Um, <laughs> doesn't count as a DICE game, though, technically. It does not count in my Oh, mind. yeah, it's, a, it's not a <laughs> DICE game. It's well, a sledgehammer, I guess. Cool idea, how are you? How are you feeling on Battlefield 1? Very excited. I, uh, I guess I'm... S- I, I'm super into history. If I wasn't doing what I'm doing now, I definitely would be at like maybe a history major. Um, love World War One. Love World War Two. Was very happy to hear that they were going back to one of the World Wars to find out what was World War One. Though was super exciting because I don't think there's been many games at all. The only one that comes to mind is like a Steam game. I think it was called like Verdun. That's the only uh, World Valiant War. Hearts. Valiant Hearts. That one too. That's um, a good so game. I'm very excited to see it. Um, I know they're adding a campaign to Battlefield One, so I'm hoping that goes well because I mean. Good campaigns are always nice, and Battlefield hasn't been very known for them, so I hope yeah. this one kind of changes that. Uh, they definitely have, like, I know they're doing a lot of stuff with pre-order bonuses on different, like, s- squads and things, so I think they have a lot of story potential for that, so hopefully it turns out well. That screenshot of that game at max settings with, like, the rain falling on the gun is, like, insane. Yeah, it's crazy, because I've, I've been playing Battlefield 4 a lot more, and, like, I've honestly noticed it's kind of starting to look its age. Three, it's only came out like two, two and a half years ago now. I think it came out October 2013, and it already looks pretty outdated, to be honest with you. And I used to think this game looked like amazing. Yeah, so, I think it's also like relative to everything you're seeing now that looks, you know, astounding. So it's like, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what about you, Dom? What are you playing? So I want to finish up Skyward Sword. Um, I've heard that the ending boss in this game is actually really, really cool. Um, 
So I'll report back on that because I know you're so, you know, I'm eager so to hear enthralled. about it. Yeah. yeah. Edge my seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then after that, I'll get back into Syndicate. So, yep. Did you ever you... finish the original Zelda? Nope. No. Too too abstract for you? I, yeah, I I just can't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I will someday. I'll grind away at it, but I, it's just you got to be in the right mindset, I guess. Yeah. Mechanically, it's not very friendly to modern yeah. day gamers, I think. Um, Dom, yeah. are you going to be missing your motion controls with the Wiimote once you're done with this game? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to throw the damn thing away. Yeah. <laughs> um, not even going to sell it. I'm just going to burn it. So. <laughs> That's what we've been playing, or well, actually what we're going to be playing next week, forgive me. Um, yeah, thank you guys for, you know, if you share, if you follow, if you subscribe, all that stuff, continue to do that. Uh, we're small, but we can we, we grow every week, little by little, um, but every share, every like, every follow, every subscription helps. If you can, like us and rate us on iTunes, it helps as well. Like us on SoundCloud if you want to do that as well. Um, where can they find you, Jordan Boyd? Um, so I'm in a few different places. Um, I'm on Twitter as Jordan G. Boyd, just my regular name with a G in the middle because my middle name's Garrison. Um, I'm also a fun moderator. Fact. Yeah, fun fact. I'm uh, also a moderator on the Kind of Funny forums. Uh, my username is Jiggy, J-I-G-G-Y. And if you want to hit me up on PlayStation Network, my uh, name is Bug-Eyed, B-U-G-I-E-D. And that's pretty much everywhere you can find me. Oh, uh, your YouTube. I like your YouTube. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> that seems like the biggest one to forget. <laughs> Um, my YouTube right now is The Potion Shop. Um, not super sure what I want to make into it, but I do upload there every now and again. I'm trying to find something that I kind of want to set in motion and do like fully on that channel. I've just been kind of playing around with reviews and funny little videos and other things trying, like that. So you can definitely check that out. Trying to find your niche or your Trying niche. to find my niche, exactly. We're American. We say niche here. Don. Or your gif or like... your jif. <laughs> <laughs> I like the name at least, The Potion Shop. That's cool. Yeah, I think it's got a lot of potential. Um, I might get 209 subscribers right now, so... It'd be cool if anyone wants to check it out. That'd be awesome. If you haven't checked him out yet, definitely go. His reviews are really well done. Um, I, I like them a lot. Yeah. Uh, your name's uh, cool, too. I like your name a lot. Jared, yeah. something else. Uh, I'll be working on a um, couple Vita reviews this week uh, for the site. And yeah. I'm going to be doing uh, Bastion and Gravity Rush. Hopefully, I'll have those done by next week's show. One of my favorites, Gravity Rush. One of my favorite games ever. Love it. Awesome. Love so. Game. Definitely go check out Jordan and all of his links. They'll be in the description of the full episode posted on YouTube. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, it'll probably be I'll, – I'll put it in his uh, a specific topic as well, Pokemon Go and Nintendo. Um, so definitely check out all of his links. Uh, we appreciate the guests we have. We got Blessing. Now we got Jordan. We went from having no guests for, what, 18 episodes to having two and three episodes. So it's <laughs> awesome. Uh, just like Blessing, you're welcome back anytime, Jordan. We really appreciate it. Thank you for um, having me. And, yeah. Thank you guys for listening, watching, whatever you felt like doing with this podcast. Uh, <laughs> any closing words? We'll start with you, Jordan, OG Jordan. You know, if I was a Dothraki, Jared, <laughs> today would be a very tough day. Oh, God. Uh, Dom, closing words? I'm just excited to see baby face Jordan. Oh, God. Uh, Jordan B., any closing words? Stay sexy. <laughs> All right, guys. Catch you guys in episode 21. Bye.